All right, so um, everyone, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome you to tonight's webinar. And I've seen Chris's slide deck, so I know that we have a fast and furious uh, hour in, uh, ahead of us, which is fantastic. Um, some of you may have seen Chris before when he was at in Edmonton or may have um, participated in the webinars that the Calgary Regional Consortia did. But regardless, I, I never get tired of hearing Chris present. Um, I've been a fan ever since, well, probably before that, but since this book. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, so uh, Chris does lots of great stuff beyond the AAC implementation. But because we have such a jam-packed hour, I am going to uh, pass it along to you, Chris, and you can introduce yourself and tell the rest of the story. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody. Can you just type in chat, everyone, if you can hear me okay? And um, yeah. And if you are in a room with other people, like, are you just here by yourself? Or are you like with a bunch of other people? I'd love to see that in the chat. Um, and I, I hope um, that uh, the chat. Yeah, there we go. So we alone. I'm at home. Okay, too bad. But maybe that's nice. It's okay to be alone. Uh, other people, I can hear you. Great, Sherry. Thank you. Uh, three of you there. I can hear you watching alone. Okay, at work. Great, great. I just want to test the chat and to see there what was going on there. All right. So the way I do my presentations are always in Google Slides or most usually in Google Slides uh, because if I make any mistakes, I can go and fix them. So what you're looking at right now is the URL for this slide deck. So uh, some people have, have told me in the past during webinars or presentations that like they have a second screen up. Uh, so they can be following along on one screen and then kind of flip through the slides on their own. So this is your moment. If you want to have that second screen or you want to have the URL, that's that's what it is. It's bit.ly slash AACERLC2018. Or you can also just scan that QR code. That should bring it right up on your phone as well. So I'm going to give you a second there. I'll leave that up and just explain who I am a little bit. Uh, so my name is Chris Bouguet, and I am a speech therapist that works in Loudoun County Public Schools, which is in Northern Virginia. Um, you'll see my next slide talks about how, even though I work for Loudoun, that this is not affiliated with them. So um, this is I, everything I say here is on my own, right? I'm not really representing them. But uh, a lot of my stories and, and, and experiences come with working with Loudoun and the teachers there who are just fabulous and great. Um, I work in assistive technology. So even though I'm a speech therapist, I often think I'm an assistive technology person with a speech background, not the other way around, but I'm a speech therapist that works in assistive technology, only because I've been doing that for like 16 um, years, 1600 years, I think. Yeah, no, like 16 years I've been working directly as an as assistive technology person. So I think I've vamped long enough. Hopefully you got the, uh, uh, the, the URL by now. If not, we can throw it in. Uh, the chat at, at the end as well. People come in late, people, but there's my disclosure statement saying that, uh, you know, I don't have any uh, relative um, or relevant financial or non-financial relationships with anything here. Like I said, I work for Loudon, but they're not really affiliated with this for this particular presentation. I do a podcast. I'm one of the co-hosts of a podcast called Talking With Tech, uh, which is this, the Talking With Tech podcast. We put out weekly episodes um, where we have, have interviews with different people. Just today, we put out an interview with Aaron Sheldon, who, is, uh, uh, who works with uh, cortical visual impairment or knows students with cortical visual impairment. And, uh, and, and so we interviewed her about that. And so every week there's different, and I make a little money off the advertising of that podcast, um, it, meaning sometimes uh, we have sponsors for, for episodes. So uh, I wanted to, to disclose that. And also to let you know that I did get to write a, a book uh, second book, this one's called The New Assistive Tech that just came out in May, so it's not even a year old, and it's all about redesigning your, uh, your assistive technology program from a coaching mindset. All right, so, excellent, thanks, Kate. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, all right, so let's talk about today. This um, presentation is going to make uh, some, here we go, uh, it is going to be all about AAC and implementation. We're really going to focus on implementation. When I think about AAC uh, service delivery, I think about it in these kind of four phases. First, we kind of have to consider what the student might need. Then we have to select what that student might need. And then we have to implement what the student might need. And then we reflect on all of that 
and uh, and make adjustments and changes. It is. See it there again, Laura. Got it. Quick, get your, get your, grab your phone. Take a picture. A A C E R L C two thousand eighteen. So today's focus is only going to be on the implementation part. That means I've made some presumptions, right? I've, I've assumed that the people in this room uh, know that, uh, that these things, that, that, that when you're working with a student with a disability and you're working with AAC, that someone has to believe that given, given enough time and enough the right tools and the right instruction, that they will eventually be able to say whatever they want to say, however they want to say that. Uh, whatever they want to say, however they want to say it. Um, I'm also making the assumption that because we already worked through the, the, the consideration and selection process, that you know students that are already working with some sort of system that would give them access to robust language, uh, meaning that someday they, they can use this system to say whatever they want to say. I'm making the assumption that you, those of you here know about uh, the importance of motor planning and motor memory and keeping the buttons, the cells, or whatever the access method is, keeping the, the symbols in the same spot, not changing that up for students. Uh, these are all things that I would talk about in a different webinar, uh, and we would hit these, the, hit these more, uh, more exclusively um, and with more slides and talk about them in, in, in more depth. I'm making the assumption that you know these things. If you don't, let me know and, and we can talk about doing some, some more. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk much about core vocabulary. I'm going to assume again that you've heard of core vocabulary and know what that is and understand the benefits of trying to teach those words. Uh, and then again, I'm only going to touch on this a little bit, but the idea that the way to teach uh, language to students, the way to teach the students language using their AAC device is by modeling on that device. Uh, a strategy called aided language stimulation or also called aided language input or partner assisted communication or partner assisted input. But the idea is that you're modeling on the student's device. Cool. Uh, if you don't, like I said, we'll work that out in another webinar sometime or listen to our podcast because the podcast goes through a lot of those as well. All right, cool. So real quickly, these are what I call the necessary components of, of AAC. Someone has to believe that someday they'll be able to say whatever they want to say using the device. It's up to us to teach them how to do that. Expect and work towards something called spontaneous novel utterance generation. Again, being able to say whatever you want to say whenever you want to say it. Teach core vocabulary. Consider the motor plan when you're selecting the device and, and, and every decision you make afterwards. You're going to model using least to most prompting. And I know I'm going fast here because I said these are all the presumptions that I've already made um, uh, that, that you know this. Um, if you don't know about least to most prompting, there's going to be a slide on it later. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. Um, and then most importantly, and I'll hit this again, that this teaching kids how to use language and learn language is fun. It's not a drill and kill sort of thing that uh, sucks the fun out of being in school or being in therapy. The, the idea is for kids to enjoy themselves. And when they enjoy themselves and you enjoy yourself, everyone learns better, you know. Uh, okay, so just to put that in, there's a nice little graphic that I like to use that say, here's kind of the sweet spot. If you can do these three, merge these three components together, you maybe have started your path towards success with, uh, with AAC. Core vocabulary, aided language, motor access planning and memory. All right. We are specifically going to focus on implementation, so here we go. Uh, when you're implementing a device, the first thing I think you really need, and you've selected it, you've got a device, you've put it in a student's hands, uh, I think one of the first things you need to do is measure the language of the student. Maybe even that comes part of, part of uh, selecting the, and even before selecting the device is measuring the student's language. But you definitely have to think of where is the student in regard to their language abilities. So I like to use the analogy that language is like a staircase and uh, we are all uh, somewhere on the staircase. Most of us who, are, who speak verbally um, and are verbal communicators might be at the top of that staircase and that we can say whatever we wanna say, however we wanna say it. 
some AAC users are at the top of that staircase where they can use their system uh, to say whatever they want to say. But many early uh, learners, kids who are just getting communication devices, chances are they're down on the bottom of the staircase or one or two steps up on the staircase. And so the first task is to kind of figure out where they are on that staircase, like how far down at the bottom. Uh, if language development is a staircase, then which step are they on? Right? Uh, and so what you need are some tools to help you decide where the students are uh, so that you can measure the growth over time. Uh, again, this could be a whole separate webinar on just uh, measuring. So I'm going to go, go through these quickly. I'm going to make the assumption that you've heard of Brown's grammatical morphemes. That, uh, if you're a speech therapist or, or work with speech therapists, that you know that th these kind of represent a, uh, a, a progression of language uh, where you can measure language by, by moving through these morphemes, like learning when, when to use ing, when to use in, when to use on, when to learn, when you use plural s, and so forth. Right? So you can use that as sort of a benchmark of where students are. Um, sometimes I find that some of the earliest learners are, are even pre-Browns 14. So we have to think of even a more uh, discrete way of measuring language before, before this. Right? Um, another way to measure language is uh, our old friend mean length of utterance. Uh, some speech therapists I know when they see that they start to shudder because it takes them back to uh, their grad school days. But uh, so there's this weird phenomenon that happens sometimes when an AAC device gets put in place or considered where the, the therapist working with the, the, that, that student seem to think, oh, well, the device is in place. I need to know some whole new set of magic, you know? And the truth is there are some certain skills, yes, but it doesn't mean you forget everything you know about working with language. You can lean on your knowledge of, of, of how to create mean length of utterance or how to measure me, the mean length of utterance for people and use that as a, as a, as a barometer for how a student is doing. Uh, this is a tool that maybe you've heard of mean length of utterance, maybe you've heard of um, uh, Brown's grammatical morphemes, but this one might be new to you. This is called the APT and it was developed by a uh, bunch of educators out in the state of Iowa. And what they were finding in their neck of the woods is that uh, many of the teachers that they were working with were having trouble selecting which tools they should use to help evaluate uh, language and to help select AAC systems. So they created a tool themselves to help teachers select AAC systems and, and, and to measure language. Um, and so that's called the APT, and there's a link right there uh, that, that takes you to it that you can explore uh, in the future. But you can see it, it kind of goes through uh, what different things you'd be considering for a student that might be in these different stages, emergent, pre-symbolic, emergent, symbolic, context dependent, and then an independent com communicator. Uh, the DAG it was, is put out by Toby Dynavox, and that is another uh, assessment tool. It is like a PDF. You click on that, it's a PDF, and you'll see that it kind of walks you through those same um, similar uh, stages uh, of development. And so you can kind of, at, it kind of asks you questions and then you kind of answer them either yourself or as a team to again, put, it, put students on the staircase of language development. Another tool that some of you may have heard of, have you heard of it? Please put it in the chat if you've heard of it or if you've even using it. I'd love to hear your experiences with the communication matrix. Uh, it's another tool that you can use. Great, you're using it, great. Um, some people say that it takes a little long to actually use. Would that be your experience as well? Like, I'd love to hear your feedback. Go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, uh, so, yes, absolutely using it. Great, people are loving it. Fantastic. So, cool. It sounds like you know about it, and so I'm going to move on from there. One you might not know about, because we developed it, uh, we in Loudoun County Public Schools developed it, is called um, the COAL the continuum, continuum of language expression. So we looked at the communication matrix and found it that for, if we wanted every teacher to do it, it might feel like a little daunting because it is a process to go through. Um, and so we wanted to make kind of a simplified version. And so, and we felt like one of the things that was lacking for a lot of our teachers is they didn't really understand the early, very, very early uh, language development, what that looked like. So we created a Google sheet uh, that is a, uh, well, what we first we did is uh, me and a two speech therapists and a preschool teacher poured over all of this research and measurement tools and books on early language development. And we created our own step-by-step -step kind of 
staircase, if you will. These are all the skills that would happen earlier, and then they and and as the student grows, you'd expect the next skill, and then here's a next set of skills. We we put them in our own kind of what we call stages: stage one, stage two, um, and then we created a Google Sheet that would allow teams to. You could pull it up there, and you can look at it. Would allow uh, teams to come together and ask questions like. Well, okay, does the student um, glance at a person or visual stimulation for one second? And you could say whether that student did that occasionally or never or usually or always. And uh, it would eventually score if you could fill this out until, until you capped and meaning you're getting a bunch of zeros and you felt like you didn't need to go on any further. And it would give you a score that you could measure. And that would give you something that you could then use a, a year again, a year later, a year post intervention and say, let's go through this, this coal again and see where the student has made gains. And you could see kind of a number grow, if you will. So check it out. Uh, you say it's not, you know, it, it's meant to be just a informal tool that you can use to, to uh, assess language. Um, if we had more time, if this was like a full day presentation and I was there with you, uh, we might spend some time where I'd ask you to take a student and actually pick one of these tools to, to, to go through and, and experiment on just to get a feel for what the tools are like, but I'm gonna ask you to do that on your own time. All right, so after you've measured language and you feel like you know what step it's the student's on, now you gotta teach language. Um, uh, so uh, when you're teaching language, just like in any other uh, teaching language and using a for AAC is no different, you start with goals. I don't have a lot of slides here on goals. I'm gonna make the assumption that you know how to use goals. Um, but uh, when you're coming, when you're thinking of AAC, uh, try and keep the goals. There's lots of different ways you can write goals, but kind of a, a rule of thumb is to keep the pragmatics in mind. So you might, because that's really the purpose behind communication. These are the reasons why you communicate. And so if that's the reason you should you communicate, then that might be a good goal is to, is to say, I, I want a student to reject. I want a student to know how to ask. I want a student to know how to, to make a command. Those are good, uh, good ways to think about goals. Um, we do a whole Talking With Tech episode on how to write effective goals and IEPs, so go check that out uh, as well. Um, the reason I bring this up and I put this little meme in here is like there's this little girl that says, uh, should we teach language or should we practice AAC? And she's like, well, why don't we do both? And everyone cheers, right? It, Again, some people seem to think that these are two separate things. There's teaching AAC and teaching language, and there's certainly the operational part of it is like turning on a device and, and, and making sure it's charged and, and uh, knowing how to program. There's a, there's, there is a component that is specific to teaching AAC, but all the rest of it is just language. It's just teaching language. And so you're going to see that there's um, a lot of overlap here that is just regular language therapy. Um, when you're thinking about implementing a device and you're doing, you're teaching language, you're teaching words and what words mean, uh, you do all of these activities. And just out of curious, um, you see I have here, you know, you're going to read stories, you do crafts, you're going to play games, you do music, there's interactive lessons, then you're going to have interactions with the student. Just out of curious here, which one of you think, which, which do you think on this particular slide is maybe the most important, you know? Do you think maybe reading stories is the most important or maybe crafts is most important? I'm curious, this is my own little informal uh, assessment that I'm doing here, what you all think might be the most important. There is no right or wrong answer. Yeah. Interactive lessons maybe. Uh -huh. Interactions, 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 yeah. Stories, yeah. You know, I think maybe one reason, tell me, tell me if I'm wrong here, some people are saying stories is because Often, uh, again, with AAC, we find that there's a lack of literacy instruction, right? That uh, there, student, ha I, I get to go into plenty of autism classrooms and there is a, you go and you sit and you do file folder games for a few minutes, then you come over and have a break and then you do a different set of file folder games and then you take a break and then you come over and have a little gross motor activity and then you go take a break. And the whole time you're thinking, where's the literacy? Where is the teaching of the words? Where is the... Uh, and, and is that a small microcosm of the day, which shouldn't it be a much more rich environment? Um, the reason I think a lot of people were saying interactions is because, again, same thing, go and do a file folder game, it's not really all that interactive, you know? It, even if someone's sitting with you, it's kind of like, all right, let's open, it can be, 
open the file folder game, rip this piece of paper off and put it on this side and rip the next piece off and put it on this side, whatever the game might be. Um, and what I found over the years is that if you're having fun with the students, if you're engaging and have positive interactions, if it is enjoyable for you, I mean, no one really wants to go and do file folder games. Like no one jumps out of bed in the morning and go, I can't wait to do my file folder games today. Um, I mean, maybe some do, but I don't see it that often in the, in the classrooms that I work with. And so it's these having these rich interactions that might be the most, uh, possibly might be one of the, the most in, important parts of the whole therapy process is, is just interacting in a natural way with students. That, that's fun. Okay, so all of that boils down to designing awesome educational experiences. You are the ones in charge of designing what that student goes into. I often hear uh, this is a, a, with a, when working with kids with AAC. He's just not motivated to use it. It's nothing. He's just not. Like, this kid's just not motivated by anything. It's like, well, I don't know if that's the case. It, maybe it's just that you haven't found a way to motivate him because coming into the classroom and asking him to do these boring activities is not motivating for anyone, you know? Um, and when you reframe that and you think, what could you do to make it more motivating, the whole class more exciting, the whole, the experiences that they're in um, be more engaging, teachers seem to switch and they go, oh yeah, 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 what can I do, right? Uh, yeah, it's about manipulating the environment. Exactly, brain works. Uh, awesome. Um, you're in charge of it too. I think that often people forget that, right? We get to be there as a choice and these kids are often not there by choice, right? They would just assume not be in that room with you. So how can we, they would rather be maybe, you know, back home in their beanbag chair watching TV or watching YouTube, right? Uh, and then we give them that as a reward when they run over to, to, to take a break. Um, but how can we make what we're doing just so much more enticing so that we're, it's so engaging that they wanna be there? All right, I'm gonna climb off my soapbox and give you some, some strategies. Um, I think of uh, the design process like this when you're trying to teach language. First, you start with a word. Um, there's a whole philosophy out there of uh, teaching one word at a time. You're gonna see some slides out here in, in the future. Uh, and yeah, I agree with that. You teach one word at a time. Uh, sometimes though, I think it makes sense to teach two words at a time. Meaning, I'm, let's, see how, let's see, if I'm gonna teach go, what should I teach as, along with that everybody in chat? I'm gonna teach go, I might as well teach. Okay, yeah, yeah, if I'm gonna teach in, then I might as well teach. Right, out, right, out, out, out. Um, if I'm gonna teach put, oh wait, everyone is, the texts aren't coming in as fast, right? Because put, uh, put, take, in, on, right? Those, uh, some people might say away, right? So sometimes words have these natural pairs and it doesn't make sense just to teach one word. You wanna teach two. Uh, and other times they don't have a natural pair like put. And so you'd wanna focus on maybe that word. Uh, and then I also say the word, the, you see the, the, the phrase there, language unit, because sometimes I think, uh, depending on where a kid is on that, that their staircase, they're high enough on the staircase, maybe you uh, don't teach a one word or two word approach anymore. Maybe you're looking at teaching clusters of words, uh, groups of words, or language units. And what I mean by language units, I mean those morphemes, you know? Imagine whole lessons around ing, uh, ed, plural s, right? Not just focusing on one word, but a group, or, or parts of words. Or, or imagine uh, lessons all on temporal concepts, or lessons all about position prepositions, you know, where you can group these words together. And so I call those language units, for lack of a better, better term to call them. Uh, step two there, I think, is optional. You assess what a student knows about a word. I think you can make an assumption, even if you think a student might know a word, it doesn't hurt to kind of teach it and reintroduce it. Um, then explicitly plan lessons that tie to the curriculum to teach those words. Think of the opportunities you can provide to teach the words that you're targeting. Then you do that modeling. So you sit with a student and you model the word without an expectation that they do anything at first, just that you're modeling. You see me modeling on my fictitious device here, um, but you model, and then you give them an opportunity to, to try it on the device. So that you're modeling first, and then you kind of wait expectantly and see if they will do it. If they don't, then you might prompt them a little bit by saying, mm -hmm, they're gesturing towards the device. And if uh, they still don't do it, then you might say, you your turn, try it, you know? And if they still don't do it, then you might say, right here, push this button, right? Push this one, you know? And that is a way of moving towards from least to most prompting. Uh, then 
giving some sort of strategies to generalize what you've been practicing in the classroom at home, giving some sort of feedback to the parents to say, okay, listen, we practiced in and out today. So tonight, when you're at home, have the student, because they've been practicing it all day long, they've seen me do it, have the students say in and out to you while you're loading the dishwasher. You know, you got all the dirty dishes, in, you put the fork in. In, you put the fork in. Um, have, having the student give you commands as an example. The idea being that you're trying to generalize this outside of this specific classroom environment. Collect data, of course, that's not really step six. You're doing that all, all along. And then repeat that process with new words and new language units. How does that all sound? Is that what you're doing now? Is that sort of a, a structure that you could use to, to teach uh, other people of how to teach words? Do you, do you, what's your feeling about this process? I'd love to hear it in the chat as I, as I move on. That's familiar, but cool. Um, does anyone know how to eat an elephant with a fork? Anyone know this? One bite at a time, Laura. That's right, one bite at a time, right? And so that's the first idea here, and that's kind of the step one in that seven step process is to choose one or two words. And so here are a, a bunch of early words that you might be working on, right? When I say at a time, I wanna be clear and say that I, that does not mean until mastery, right? We don't just sit on an eat and drink until the kids get eat and drink. Instead, you do eat and drink for, for a week and then you go on, awesome, awesome, Tracy. And then you move on and you do, let's say, a more and help or big and small or, or in and out and you do that the next week. And I say at a time instead of once a week because uh, you're up in Canada, you know, you get snow, right? We get snow where we are too. And so, and people get sick. You have, you guys get colds in Canada? I bet you do. Um, you know, people get sick. And so, no, you don't. Okay. <laughs> uh, moving there. Uh, th the idea is, Sometimes as a teacher, you just, as a discretion, you, you, you give teachers discretion. You know that you just did not hit eat and drink like you thought you should have this week. You know, maybe the assistants were sick. Maybe the students were sick. Maybe they came in and they were sleeping and, and it, you just know you didn't give it your all this week. Maybe you had snow days. Um, and so you might go on for two weeks. You know, here in the States just last week, we had, a, um, you know, American Thanksgiving. So we had three, some of us had two or three days off last week. Maybe that's not a full week of instruction to, to hit these words. We're going to extend it into next week, that kind of stuff. So uh, that's what I mean by one or two words, or core vocabulary concepts at a time. Any of you working in the preschool environment? This is not necessarily specific to preschool, but okay, Julia, perfect. Anyone else? Yes, okay, yes, yes, yes. All right, so often when I see in preschool, and you tell me if this is consistent in your environments here, um, and really a lot of other environments as well, but it's specifically preschool, uh, is that the way they design their curriculum is often based on um, a concept or a theme, you know? We're gonna do apples this week or insects this week. Does that sound right? This is our insect unit. This is our, um, our, our, our fruits and vegetables unit. This is our camping unit, you know? Is that kind of how you do it for, for a week? And so, and then as a, as a second thought, they think, okay, well, we're teaching insects or we're teaching apples. How can we mesh this, the teaching of, of insects with the language we want to use? And so what a language-based curriculum does, a language-based approach is, yes, excellent, uh, Jansen, S. Jansen. Um, what a language-based curriculum or a language-based approach is, it kind of just flips that on its ear. And it says, you know what we're going to do is we're going to instead of thinking of the theme first of insects or, or um, apples, we're gonna say, we're gonna teach prepositions. We're gonna teach in and out. Now, what would be a good way to teach in and out? Oh, I know. How about insects and apples, right? We can have insects go into the apple or they eat the apple or we can have, the, um, uh, then they come out of the apple, right? And apples go in your mouth and then, uh, um, uh, and so the idea is, is that you're thinking of a word first or a language concept first and then you're building that in, um, you're building lessons around it, which doesn't mean you have to change away of the, uh, the, the activities. You're still doing kind of the same activities, you know? You're still putting apples on a tree, but then you're, you're but instead of putting apples on a tree, or, or, or here's a better example, rather than apples on a tree. Um, every morning, you might still be doing your um, who's at school and who's not at school activity, and you're dragging kids over, you know, or taking a picture from one side to the next, where one side of the, the board or the screen is kids at their home and others as a side or the picture of uh, kids in school. And so you're dragging them from side to side. 
um, and you're putting them in, putting them in, putting them in. They're coming out of their house and they're going into school, out of their house, into school. Same activity, but you have thought, okay, I'm putting language first, in and out. What would be a good way of teaching in and out? Oh, I know I can teach in and out. I could do that with the, our calendar activity of, of who's here every day. Make sense? I just want teachers thinking when they're planning, not about what theme they're doing, but what language they want to teach and then build the theme around that. Uh, another way to plan all week long, this is adapted from a friend of mine in Idaho named Eric Inger. He uh, talks about planning all week long so that Monday is when you're introducing new words to students. So we call this Model Monday. You might know that you have to do much more modeling on Monday than on, let's say, Friday because, and again, maybe you have to model all along, right? It's, maybe it never stops. But the, the idea is, is that you especially don't have an expectation that a student is going to know a new word because you're giving them new words on Monday. Literacy Tuesday, how do we build in this word with reading and writing activities? Wednesday is doing something odd off the wall with these words. Um, Thursday is building in some sort of math or science activity. And then Friday could be like, okay, we're going to use fringe vocabulary. What fringe vocabulary goes along with the core vocabulary we've been teaching on these, uh, these other days of the week? You know? uh, not to say you'd only do any of these on any one day, but it just gives you a, a, a way to structure your week so that everybody knows, oh, it's Thursday, we're going to do a lot of math today. Everyone knows it's Tuesday, we're going to be doing a lot of reading and writing today. Uh, when I say everyone, I mean the administrators, the teaching assistants, the parents, the, the homework comes home that night, uh, has activities centered around these concepts. Another approach is to plan the language activity. Um, uh, and another approach is to, to practice a language, uh, to plan the language opportunities all day long, uh, where you try and target at least 100 opportunities to, to expose that student to that word or, or words or language unit. Um, and some people would say you can even get to 200, right? So, uh, yes, well, so are you, are you asking the question, what, what about total inclusion? What about students who learn in general, general ed classrooms? Absolutely, right? Um, if you, I'm talking, yes, in those particular slides back here, I'm talking about self-contained, yes. But in here, the concepts are the same. You, 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 let's see if this answers your question. Right? So whatever the student's uh, schedule is all day long, right? Give me a second to absorb this, this meme. Okay. Whatever the schedule is all day long, whether they're self-contained, whether they're partial inclusion, maybe they're completely included, right? You take the student's schedule here, right? So morning circle, then there's a science activity, a literacy activity, a snack time, art, math. You, uh, you create a table like this where you list out the student's schedule. Uh, the first column is how long those, those, each of those blocks of time can be. And those blocks of time could be as discrete as five minutes, maybe. It doesn't, I, in this example, I've broken it down into 30 minute blocks, but there could be like, what are we doing to teach the target word from when the student gets off the bus and then moves from the bus to hang up his backpack in the general ed classroom, let's say. Uh, and then from hanging up his backpack to the time he sits down and does his morning work, how are we going to, imp uh, how, what, when can we build in the, uh, the, the language opportunity to teach whatever the word is. And again, expose them to that word, whatever that word is. So in this example that you're seeing here, I've chosen the word put, right? And so you can see during morning circle, what I want the teacher to do is take a, uh, a blank version of this and, and fill it out. Okay, during morning circle, we have attendance. Uh, how are we gonna practice put? Well, we're gonna put others, and I think I can ask the students uh, or, or the students can tell me where to put others, um, you know, again, from home to school. I could probably do that five times. And then we're doing the calendar and we're doing the weather. Well, that's all I'm just dragging the, the days over or someone's dragging the, you know, the number of the day over. And so they're putting it from here to there. That's another five exposures. And then at weather time, when we have our little bear up in our weather uh, next to our, our, our interactive whiteboard or or wherever. All right, we're gonna go look out the window. Okay, what does he need to put on? Oh, he's putting on his hat. He's putting on his coat, you know, those sorts of things. And you plan that way to teach the word put during morning circle. And then what happens after morning circle? Well, now it's science time. We're all going over to our 
our desks and we're going to have these little plants on our desks or whatever. You're coming to our group table and where we're going to all rotate from station to station. And when you're here, we're going to be putting plants, uh, we're going to be planting plants. And the idea is whatever the activities are, you're planning all day long to be thinking about that word put and how you can expose the student to the word put with a little number after, ne after it. So you can tally those up and say, yes, we expose this student to the word put. We've given them an opportunity to say the word put the, you know, on their device um, this number of times. And uh, right here on this particular slide, down at the bottom, again, if we were there all day, we would, we would try and start planning, planning some of these out. But here's a template that you can, you can use. Uh, it's a Google template that you can use. And you can give the teachers and they can start filling out uh, together if you wanna, wanna try that, if you like that idea. A uh, little word of warning there for those that you said, uh, I like this, the idea of planning all day long. Some teachers that I've tried to do it with, um, and we, I started here, and it's a learned lesson of my own, is that they've had to pull back and say, okay, I can't, I, I'm struggling to implement put all day long, Chris. Can I do, a, do, can I do it for this 30 block, and then this 30 block this week? And then next week, can I try and do another 30 block and do whatever the next words are, um, and try and learn how to implement AAC, not all day long, that feels too overwhelming, but in these smaller intervals, working my way towards all day long. And I, I have seen that is, that is something that they, many teachers need. They can't just jump into doing it all day long. Um, so I've, I've, I've rolled back my immediate expectations and, and I give them the choice. Well, here's the, here's the planning guide. So if you are gung ho and want to try and plan all day long, go for it. But if not, then, um, then you can uh, then take your time with it. So, and then here's some examples of communication bridges. Again, how to generalize at home, giving teachers, giving uh, parents strategies for how to implement them at home, right? Uh, it's super exciting when we see device used outside the classroom. Yes, we know we've got carryover. Uh, one of the primary principal ways to implement uh, a communication device, I think one of the major uh, pitfalls, I see a lot of teachers do it immediately when they get an AAC device, immediately they want the students to start using the device. And if they don't start using the device, then there must be something wrong with the device. Um, or again, the kid's, not just, the kid's just not motivated to use their device. What they failed to done and what they have failed to do is this particular strategy, which is called descriptive teaching. So, um, so descriptive teaching is the idea that uh, when I first introduce a device with a student, I will just sit down with a device and then I will just describe what I'm do, do, doing, meaning I'm just gonna narrate my own life. I sit, or maybe just sit, uh, I do, and I pick up the crayon and starts coloring. Um, uh, ooh, I like it, you know? And then I might say, um, my turn, and I'm just showing the student without any expectation that, that they even do anything that I'm using the device. Then after I've done that for a little while, meaning right there in that session, like maybe I'll do that for four, four to five minutes. Then I'll introduce it to the student and do that least the most prompting that I was talking about where I'm teasing them with the idea that, or not teasing, tempting, tempting them, um, not teasing them, like here it is, I'm gonna take it away. I'm tempting them to use the device um, so that they can then start saying, uh, well, okay, I just saw you use it. Let me try and say, like, like if I have a practice crayons, I might say open and then I'd close up the crayons they go to reach for the crayons, they'd be like, here's a, I showed you open, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna do it, you know? And maybe the student will say open, if not, I might have to model it again. But my, the point is, I am using, I'm just narrating my, my, my who, I'm, I'm showing the students how to use the words that I'm targeting. Here's an example of that prompt hierarchy that I was talking about, that least to most prompting. So I'm, I've mentioned it now twice is how I would do that, but this is like a little cheat sheet that I like to give to the teachers because it's a skill you need to learn. It doesn't come natural. So you got to take a moment to, to kind of practice it and kind of work through how to do this prompting so you can get better and better at it. And I find um, they print this cheat sheet off and they keep it as like a little index card or they even they post it up on the wall um, or they do a little practice sessions around it. They get to learn that most, least to most prompting. Are people using least to most prompting now? Do they see teachers using it or do you see a lot of like just prompting all over the place, like grabbing kids' hands and making them do it or... Um, going, you do it, or uh, uh, I don't know, do you see it all over the place? I'm curious what your experiences have been in your neck of the woods. It varies, yeah, that's what I've seen too. Um, 
another strategy for teaching the words, and again, this is for the students, but it's also uh, to help, I think, the educators wrap their brains around how to teach words, because again, you see kids get AEC devices and the teaching language kind of jumps out of people's heads because they think they get so intimidated by the device sometimes. But what we're looking at here is something called the Freyer model. Uh, and it's a way of teaching vocabulary to any kids, right? Uh, the idea is you put the word in the center and then you use this little graphic organizer to teach what the word means. You know, you give a definition, you have some sort of drawing, you give uh, uh, some synonyms or examples of how to use the word, and then you give an opposite. So uh, if you're gonna teach the core vocabulary word of go, well, what does go mean? Well, put the definition there so everyone can think about it, right? It's about moving and leaving. Here's some pictures that go along with it, or maybe it's the symbols that are on the student's communication device. Here are examples of how to use it, and then here's the opposites. Um, maybe at the early preschool level, I wouldn't be doing this, but for students that, again, maybe in the general ed classroom that you're talking about, this might be a great way to, to at least get teachers thinking about how to think about core vocabulary words. Yeah, right, how many other kids would this help? Exactly, exactly. Um, when we're teaching words, the, the way to teach a word is not in isolation, but in relation to what it means with all the other words that go around it. So uh, how do you use it in context? So uh, you describe what, what a, the, the, what a, what's the purpose of using this word? Uh, you describe words that are similar and different. That's kind of what that Freyer model was getting at, is that it forces you to think about what those similarities and differences are. Um, it describes the meanings uh, of the words. and then. And then to think about what category, how what categories would you put this word in? All right, everybody, take a look at this picture. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a teacher that is starting to use core vocabulary in their, in, their, uh, in their classroom. They have got the idea that they're gonna post the core vocabulary word up on the wall so that they can see it. And that everyone who comes in their room knows this is the word we're working on. We're working on the word in here, right? which I think is an awesome strategy and I think everyone should do. I think it's a great, uh, for a lot of other students, we put the learning objectives on the wall. Why wouldn't we put the core word of the week uh, or core words of the week on the wall? I do have one little issue with this picture though. Does anyone have a guess what the issue is with the, what I would do differently, I should say? Anyone? Taking a look at that picture, you might see. Yeah, exactly, Lauren, Laura, sorry. Yes, well, yes, Nadine, you can put the symbol up there as well, um, or the icon sequence if you're using a system that uses those. But yes, um, what I was getting at here is that, look at those sight words. Those are core vocabulary words too. You don't need to have two separate words. The core word of the week could be the sight words of the week, and the sight words of the week could be the core words of the week. It could just be words of the week, because early sight words mesh, uh, the lists of early sight words mesh with lists of core vocabulary very nicely. There's a huge overlap there. So I don't think you necessarily need to separate them out. But big kudos to the teacher for posting them on the, on the wall. Another strategy that works really well um, for a lot of teachers is the idea that uh, they make little navigation cheat sheets for themselves. What you're looking at here, it's, it's hard to tell the scale in this picture. You need uh, me in the, in the foreground here, but this is a giant poster on the wall. And teachers have placed little sticky notes on the words to know where the second hit is on this particular device. This is Lamp Words for Life. Um, and uh, so here you can see, these are all words that they use frequently or like, like happy birthday and, and holidays and vacation. And where do you find those words? Well, the first hit is under make. And so it's a little cheat sheet for how to find these common words. And together, the classroom teachers are using it together. You know, they're, they're helping these little reminders. This isn't really meant for the student. It's meant as a, as a, uh, as a strategy for the communication partners, which you'll see is kind of a theme of this presentation. Uh, another uh, strategy that we like to use is something called core, core vocabulary kits or core language kits. And so this idea is picture shoebox tasks or like um, those file folder games that I was mentioning earlier, but picture shoebox tasks. Uh, so you picture a wall with a uh, all bunch of shoeboxes on them, and on each shoebox is a word. This word is go, and another shoebox is stop, and another shoebox is in, and another shoebox is out. Or in some cases, you might combine those where it's a, a go stop box and an in out box. Either way works. 
Someone could just go over, grab the box off the shelf, open it up, and you have instant activity to work on go and stop. Because in that box is a little cheat sheet that explains what to do. And then there's a bunch of toys in there that have to do with go and stop. So that you could uh, be explicitly teaching go and stop using these tools. And that is uh, was an idea by uh, my friend and colleague, Judy, Judy Schoon over there at the bottom. Uh, I like the idea of having scripted areas. Uh, so again, that cheat sheet that would be in one of those boxes would be an example of that. If you have a teaching assistant that's just learning how to do this or a sub, right? Uh, oh, do we have some? Oh, that's a good point, DJ. Uh, let me see if I can find those and add them to the, uh, add them to the, to the slide deck here, a link to them, because I, I didn't think to include them, but I'll, I'll see if I can add them in. Um, I don't have them off the top of my head. Uh, but then these same scripts that we have, these little cheat sheets, can we put them up on the wall in the certain play areas or in the certain center areas so that again, here's a script that you might say when you're playing with blocks or when you're playing with bubbles or when you're playing in the, in the, in the kitchen area or whatever. I mentioned playing games earlier. G gaming is so motivating for kids. It's so much fun to play, and it's so much core vocabulary that can be introduced in games. Um, and I like the idea of not just playing commercial games, but also making your own games. Again, there is a file folder game that we made, right? The, the idea being that it's not just a file folder game that you go and you pull out and it's an activity that you do, but we're making one that we're making one together, a little game board. Another huge strategy for implementing communication devices is uh, video modeling. Uh, so these teachers are teachers in Indiana that have made, uh, they, they, they went looking for core vocabulary videos. Um, oh, excellent, excellent DJ. Yes, yeah, switching set up accessible games is another great strategy. Um, but these teachers said, we went, to, we went looking for core vocabulary videos and we couldn't find any on YouTube. And so that's, we said, we've got to make some. And so they started making videos like you can see this one here is on up and down right and it's just a two minute video that they can show to their students and it's just all these things going up and down like someone waking up or balls going up and down or them going up and down stairs or going up and down escalators things like that um, and they often get their own kids to star in these videos so that it's even more motivating uh, i think there's a lot of research that goes behind video modeling um, and so this is a great way i would challenge you one to go watch their videos but then also uh, create your own videos of students learning the core vocabulary words and showing what core vocabulary words mean. Another strategy to use, anyone use predictable chart writing or predictive chart writing? Uh, this again is a week long strategy with the idea that we want to embed um, literacy into the context of, uh, of what we're teaching. And so the idea is you would uh, sit with the students and you'd have a chart behind you. That could be an old paper-based chart, you know, like a flip chart that you have or it could be a, on your interactive whiteboard. And you do some sort of sentence completion activity, like um, uh, I see a pumpkin in the room. I see a ghost in the room. I see a witch in the room, all for Halloween, right? Um, or, and you just fill these out and you ask each student to, to say, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? And you write it explicitly. I see a ghost. I see a which, right, you're putting this explicitly uh, uh, on, the, on the chart behind you. That's day one. Day two, you interact with the chart in some way and re review it, you know. Maybe you're highlighting all the words to start with S, like C and C and C, right? Uh, and then on day three, you come back during this literacy activity, and you're going to take that chart and you're going to cut it up. Uh, maybe the occupational therapist, right, OTs, uh, but everyone, uh, let's just say the OTs can love this and maybe coach people on how to do it. Um, but you cut up the, the chart and you make the individual words. Oh, you cut out the word C, you cut out the word I, right? Um, and then after you cut it up the next day, you give those charts, those, those words to kids and they become the word uh, where they have to put them in order in a sentence. Like, well, you have the word I, come over here and you have the word C, you go next. And you have the word which, I see which, right? You got it all together, great. Now the next kid, let's put them in order. Let's move around. Um, and so you're building the sentences together if you, if you can. And then the last day, uh, the fifth day of the week, Friday usually, is that you take those words and you put them into a book. Uh, there's slides here in the future on Tar Heel Reader and um, what's called the, the photo album feature of PowerPoint that are easy ways to make uh, books. That uh, with these words that we've been using all week long. So these are, again, reinforcing the word see 
uh, you know, in explicit, explicit activities uh, all day long or all week long. And then when you have that book, you send it home with the parents and they can read it as a great homework assignment. Here's what I did at school, you know, all week long, we practiced the word C and now I'm going to read this book with mom or mom's going to read this book with me. Cool. Anyone using this and having good results? I'd love to hear your, uh, uh, a Pictello app. Great, great. But I'd love to hear your, if you're using that and what your feedback is. Been. Now, this strategy, sabotage, is one of my absolute favorites. It's one of the reasons I got into being a speech therapist in the first place. It's one of the things I miss most about being a speech therapist on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the idea that you get to mess with kids, right? The idea here with sabotage is that you are tempting the kids to say something by being the, the crazy Uncle Chris that gets to come in there, right? Um, you, you get to come in and you get to block the doorway when they want to leave. To, you get to close the, uh, the, the uh, you, you eat the goldfish cracker and then close it real quick. Or uh, they get to put things in the box and then you close it real quick and they have to ask you to open it. All, all sorts of just, you come in with, um, with uh, uh, and all the chairs are gone. Well, how do they sit down? Well, they have to ask for the chairs. And there's so many other ways to kind of mess with kids with their routine. Again, I use that with a little grain of salt because I'm the speech therapist or consultant coming in and I don't want to set off any behaviors. You know, throwing off a routine can, could trigger behavior, but mostly it, it's an awesome teaching strategy where you're modeling what to say for a student in these situations and then they get to, uh, um, to learn what the words are. And it's fun, it's, it's fun for them and it's fun for us because it's something weird and different that doesn't happen. Uh, it breaks the routine of what's typically supposed to happen. That's what sabotage is. That's what communication temptations are. Speaking of all of that, let me ask you all this. Do any of you have your own kids? Any of you parents out there? Yes, okay. Yes, great, and a grandma, fantastic. Okay, so let me ask you this. When you pick up your kids from school and they come after school um, and you have that conversation with them, maybe at dinner time or whatever, you say, hey, what did you do at school today? What do they, what do they say? Hey, how was school? What'd you do at school today? What's their answer? Nothing, 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 right? And the reason, that's, the reason they all say that is because it's true. Nothing uh, interesting happened to them. Nothing out of the ordinary happened to them that made it worthwhile to talk about, right? It's the same old day, just like every other day. I went, I took notes, my science teacher bored me to death. Um, oh, but wait a second. My science teacher came in and he tripped over uh, a pencil and fell and scraped his knee and there's blood everywhere and he had to go to the, the, the emergency room and suddenly now there's something to talk about, right? Something, something out of the ordinary happened, right? Um, the idea here is kids, we don't talk about the mundane. Hi, honey, how was your day? It was fine, how was yours? You know, we do that as adults. But if something memorable, if something mentionable happens, then we talk about it all day. Oh my gosh, a giant shark jumped out of the ocean, was chasing my son. Oh my gosh, now you've got something to talk about. That's what we talk about at dinner parties. That's what we talk about with our friends. We talk about the, 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 the stuff that's different, that's out of the ordinary. So our job as instructors, going back to the beginning of this, of this webinar, talking about designing awesome instruction, is that we get to design the weird, the different, the, 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 the strange, the, 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 the novel, you know? We get to create those environments that allow students to talk about those. So be thinking of that when you're designing your experiences, what can I give them to talk about? What would be different today? What would they do if they came in and I was wearing this giant pink wig, you know? What if I came in today and there was paint all over my face? What would they do? What would they say, you know? Uh, how would we teach them, even if they didn't say anything, to say, you know, what is that, you know? And then look at your face all weird because you have a giant pink uh, streak of paint on it, you know? I like dressing up in costumes. I think it's super fun. Yeah. Yes, you keep plugging inclusion and I should keep doing that too. You're so right, right? Um, this is a great, a great way for, there's always something new and strange and different happening in a classroom that's hustling and bustling. And it's well, that's designed from a universal design framework as well. When there's flexibility and not everyone's doing the same thing, there's so much more to talk about, right? So bringing it back home, have fun, make it fun, make the experiences have, be fun, make it awesome for the kids, right? I'm not ending on that note. I have a few other things uh, to, to, to share here in the last uh, seven minutes of our, of our time together. Um, this, this QR code and this URL links to a Padlet. 
Padlet is just a website. It's like a giant sticky, you can put sticky notes, digital sticky notes. And what I'd love for us to build together is a, uh, uh, an idea place and where you could go and, and look at this giant Padlet board and see all these implementation ideas of awesome, awesome ideas of how to implement uh, uh, language, how to teach language all day long, how to implement, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm vamping here for a second for you to copy that down, but if you have the original URL, you have this, and I would encourage you to come back and add some, some cool activities, the, the stuff, your lessons that just, you know, you knocked it out of the park and you saw students really become engaged and have breakthrough moments. I would love to see you share just a, a sentence or two about what those were. Um, in some live presentations, I've asked people to do that, and I've, I put them in these in, in here. Um, where you can see these are some fun ways that people have all sorts of different ways where people have made learning language uh, uh, exciting and fun. So you can look through these slides at your own leisure where there's different fun activities. Right? Yes, can you commit to filling out Chris's Padlet? Yes, thank you, thank you. Please try to do that. I think it'd be awesome. Love to see what you, just one idea if you put it there. Just imagine if every person working on AAC put one idea on this Padlet we would have tons of, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to think for ourselves. We could just go there and pick something off the list to try, you know? Um, so as a summary statement for implementation, uh, I'd like to say, have a long-term vision for, for language, right? Uh, you start with those goals in measuring language. Repeat as often as possible the words across as many env environments. And that, I think the phrase that we use a lot is, uh, that you might hear in, in AAC circles is, um, uh, repetition with variation, right? Uh, so you'll repeat the words over and over again, but use them in different contexts and use them in different ways so they get a lot of exposure to those words. Um, uh, model without the expectation that the student uses it. Um, and then work as a team. I, I think I've tried to give that as an example. You are constantly feeding the team, uh, the parents with ideas of what to use when they go back home. One simple strategy at night do this with your kid because sometimes that can be overwhelming to try and model all night long. But if you did this one thing tonight, you're winning, right? Um, the next bunch of slides here, I'm not gonna actually cover, I'm gonna zoom past them because they're sort of self-explanatory. They're all about creating and adapting your own materials. Uh, there are different tools here to make uh, materials. Um, so for instance, these are just examples of adapted books where we've put some symbols on them, we simulated the text, right? Uh, I like to point out that you simulate text not for the user necessarily, but mostly for the communication partner, right? Adding text like this to the bottom of the screen, uh, which you can see here on the bottom of the page, makes it much more uh, visually um, distracting than, in, than, and than just leaving the text by itself. So this is really meant to be a cue for the communication partner when they're modeling for the student. Where's the word C? Where's the word uh, swimsuit? How do I find that? Well, this is a cheat sheet for them. DJ, do I know the impact model? Yes, I do. There's actually a slide coming up uh, on it here in a, in a little bit. Of course, we only have three minutes left, but I'll, uh, I knew I wouldn't get to all the slides that are in this presentation. Um, uh, but I'll show them to you here just in, in the last minute. I'll show you where, where you can find all that. Cool? Yes, exactly. It's a cheat sheet. It makes sense, but you don't do it for students. So these are other tools that you can use. Like I said, there's a photo album feature in PowerPoint that makes it real easy to make books and make adapted books. Uh, Google also has a similar feature, an add-on that you can have. It makes it easier to make slideshows that you can add pictures in. So you have to wrestle with sizing the pictures and all that. Um, if you're using the, the Unity or LAMP software, uh, MinSpeak, uh, the new voice software has the ability to make symbolize, symbolize text that way. And that's all free. You can download and install that. Um, and my, my last comment about making materials is that, um, is that I really like the idea of that in many schools, we're using a project-based learning approach where, where kids are asked to solve problems. Uh, and then we tie that into uh, the curriculum. Well, those problems can be great earth-shattering problems like global warming or uh, climate change or uh, saving the bees because bees are dying. They can be those sort of, you know, cleaning up our oceans. They can be those sorts of things. They can also be very small community things like in your own school. So imagine grabbing a bunch of other students and saying, listen, these kids need to learn about the same concept you're learning about. So as your project, could you 
consider making adapted material that teaches uh, the concept that you just learned about, let's say it's photosynthesis, and, and teaching someone else about photosynthesis, making these materials, and, and kids will, God, they will, they will come all over, they'll, they'll, they'll be like, yes, let me totally want to do this. I, I, they'll want to help their friends and their peers make materials. Um, so here in the last minute, I just want to share, there's, uh, uh, I think another theme, and if we had another 30 minutes, I would go into it, is that so often when we're teaching, is it from, we, my job is as a communication coach, right? And as a speech therapist that comes into the room, you often, you're, you're tasked with the idea of coaching someone else, right? Who is actually implementing the device. And that's where a lot of the research shows is that in order to be really good at implementing AAC, you have to, you have to follow kind of a series of uh, steps to get better at a specific skill. That's that impact model that was mentioned earlier, right? The DJ, I think, mentioned earlier. And so these handful of slides I'm going to let you go through on your own talk about how to coach communication partners to become better at AAC. It's not directly tied to implementation. And that's what really this presentation was about was implementation strategies, which I think I, I hope I gave you a bunch of. But it's all the implementation is only going to work if communication partners working with them know what to do. And so here is that slide I talked about with the impact model. Um, there's uh, uh, this breaks it down step by step what the impact model is, gives you some specific st strategies to, to use to teach the impact model and to teach using communication devices, um, like this wrap strategy is you use when you're, uh, when you're doing storybook reading, and, and there's even more. But I'm out of time. These, these, sorry, these analogies here. Uh, sorry, these um, not analogies. Uh, they're called acronyms. S'mores and, and Master Pals are or two other strategies you can look into. Sorry, Kathy, I'm out of time. I knew You're I wouldn't fabulous. get to this. You're fabulous. You're fabulous. But you know what? Chris, is the icing one, at the leave, them, leave them wanting more. So yes. here's a couple of things that I have taken from this is we need to bring you up. So right. you and I need to talk about that, right? We talked about that once before. I mean, we had some, so we will do that. Um, we will make sure that we, um, yeah, this was great. No kidding. Absolutely. There's some follow-up that you've suggested to me that we need to do. Um, and then I just want to um, give a shout or talk about the fact that in January, our, our webinar is all about coaching. Um, oh my goodness. Wendy, can you chime in? Help me remember her name. Uh, anyway, someone who's going to, oh, I've got a brain um, burst. So we're going to follow that up. But Chris, this was fabulous as always. So thank you. And, thank you. Uh, Jeff, thank you for the active participation, everybody. I really yeah, people were really, really engaged. I'm really, which because you're an engaging presenter. And um, we will make sure that just for everyone knows, we'll make sure that the recording gets up as well as make sure that people get the access to your slides either from the ERLC or if you um, have a challenge there you go or if you want to everyone knows that they can email me and I can push it out that way as well so thank you very much it was fabulous and um, you and I will talk about when you and your family want to come up and see the mountains Excellent. I would love that. Although, thank you so much, everybody. I'm looking forward to it, Kathy, and I'll see you at ATIA. I will indeed. Looking forward to that too. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for your marvelous participation, and uh, we'll see you in the new year. Okay. Good night. Bye. Bye.